everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am going to, um, before I introduce myself, I'm going to launch a poll just to get an idea of your roles and what age level you work with or parent. Um, my, again, my name is Ann Wilson and I am on the staff at Peak, Peak Parent Center working with the Parent and Training Parent Training and Information Center, as well as on the Alternative Dispute Resolution Project and on projects relating to youth in transition age. So, um, let's see. Um, I'm also the parent of a child who had an IEP with, um, from preschool. I also want to acknowledge that the IEP is part of a detailed legal framework and Peak Parent Center is a training and information center. Not, um, we don't provide legal advice or legal services. Um, let's see. And if anyone else wants to, this, it, it, it's anonymous on the poll, so we don't know who puts in what result, I mean, what response, but if anyone else wants to um, respond to our poll, go ahead. But it looks like we've got um, pre-K level um, and, and mostly parents we oh we have pre-k and high school so we have the ends um okay so we'll end that poll um and then it won't move on this webinar is the second part of a three-part series last week we talked about preparing for the iep Today, we'll be going over the content of the IEP. And then next week, I hope you can join us for implementation and follow-up of the IEP. Um, just a recap of what we covered last week. Um, first, the purpose of the law. And again, to restate, the IDEA makes available a free appropriate publication, public education in the least restrictive environment which includes special education and related services for eligible children with disabilities. Um, so um, we went over evaluations and eligibility, which you need before you will develop an IEP. And again, a reminder of the IEP team members, the first five listed here are required. That includes parents, uh, general education teacher, special education teacher, a representative of the school district and someone who can explain the evaluation results. The, the other three are optional, but are often at the um, IEP meeting. That includes related services staff. That could be speech therapists, occupational therapists, other people who work with the student. Others who know the student is, is a pretty broad category, but um, a lot of times parents might bring someone um, if they work with a private therapist or someone who really knows the student well and can provide input, they might bring that. Sometimes parents like to bring just a friend of the family who knows the student to kind of help offer support. And finally, the student himself or herself is optional. Although if you are in high school and you're discussing transition plans, they are required to be invited. Um, and some schools in Colorado are now doing um, student-led IEP meetings and the, it is, it's, it's seeming to be really effective both in increasing self-advocacy as well as reducing conflict because it really keeps the focus on the student when the student is right there. But you can do that at any age where you feel like it's helpful and it kind of helps the student develop an interest in their own education and help them develop agency over their education. Today, we're focusing on the content of the IEP in general, your annual IEP will look at where the student is currently, where you want to go in the next year, and the plan to get there. Um, so this, the, the next two slides are just kind of bullet points of the, the contents, and then we'll look at those more specifically. So first, you'll talk about present level of academic achievement and functional performance. That would include needs. Then you will develop measurable annual goals. Next, you'll talk about the uh, progress toward meeting the annual goals and how that progress will be me measured, uh, a statement of the special education and related services, as well as supplementary aids and services, um, a description of the modifications and accommodations that the student will receive. And the next one is if, um, as we talked about the least restrictive environment, you want the child participating in learning with non-disabled 
students to the maximum extent possible. So this would be an explanation for the reason why they are not participating with non-disabled children. And finally, the, the projected date for the beginning of the services and modifications and the anticipated frequency, location, and duration of these services. And um, as I mentioned, the, the IDEA is very specific about what needs to go into the IEP. And there's actually software, it's a data management system that the schools use to create the IEP. So a lot of times um, in the IEP meeting, you'll actually be going, a lot, they'll project and you'll be actually going through the actual IEP. Um, and so like this last time is sort of a service delivery table. So going through each of these specifically, we start with the present level of academic achievement and functional, functional performance. And this, this was changed. I think it used to be, I, I'm, I don't quote me on this, but I think it was present levels of performance, but this was um, a recognition that it's, it's not just academic, it's academic and functional. Um, this is the area where you'll get into strengths and preferences and an area where parent input is very important. Um, I think actually that, I think at least on, for my child's IEP, the section actually was called present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, including input from parent and student. So they really highlight there how important it is to get the parent and student input. Um, <clears throat> We also, um, you wanna make sure that this is a section where strengths are listed. Um, and then those, you should be using those strengths throughout the IEP. Um, we wanna maintain kind of strengths-based based thinking rather than deficit thinking. So here's an example of a strength statement you might have. Mario enjoys reading chapter books. He prefers books about sports. He likes to write mystery stories. He learns well in cooperative groups. He can remember information he has heard. Mario is in the video club at school and he takes karate lessons. So you can see you're bringing in a lot of information about the child. And, it, and this is just a quick example to give you the type of things. It, it, it could be longer than this. Um, but you know, you're bringing in interests, things he likes to do outside of school, ways that he learns well, um, and, and activities he's involved in. If you, in your handouts, you should have also received a sample strengths and strategies profile, which can give you some other ideas for things to put in this section. Um, so then once you've gone over strengths, the next thing you'll be talking about is needs. And so this is really thinking about what needs are we trying to fill? And this will help inform the development of the goals. And again, it's not just academic skills. It includes behavior, social skills, assistive technology. And that's one you really want to keep in mind because sometimes that gets overlooked. Um, independent living school skills and job related skills. You'll also, if, if a child has needs related to visual impairments, hearing impairments, communication needs and English language needs will also be addressed. And again, that's another opportunity for assistive technology. Um, and, and, and again, these, these needs should be action focused and child focused. Again, we're trying to build on strength, not talking about you know, what's wrong with the child. It's not sort of like a need in the sense of there's something wrong. It's like what needs for support does the child ha have to be able to um, access the curriculum and make progress. Um, another type of need that comes up can be um, self-advocacy needs. Um, there's a lot of, lot of emphasis on self-advocacy now. I, I see this coming up a lot in the later, maybe middle school and high school years, but it's never too early to start self-advocacy. So that's something to think about. And also um, as an active participant, as a parent, really think about, you, you may bring a different perspective than the school team brings since they're focused so much on the school environment. So really think about what you hope for your child and what skills um, are important for them to develop in terms of what you see outside of school as well. Here's some examples. Um, 
a need might be Mario needs to fluently decode wor words with more than one syllable. So you want to be specific. And again, we're looking at where they are now and where we're trying to get to this, this academic year. It doesn't mean you don't have things you're looking at in the future to, and you, you do want to have future goals, but for this IEP, we're looking at what the needs are for this coming year. Um, so you wouldn't want something Mario needs to read at grade level. You really want to look at where they are now and where you're trying to go. Another example, Jamie needs opportunities to communicate and engage in age appropriate activities with non-disabled peers. Um, this, is a, this is a good example. You don't want to say something just like Jamie needs friends. You might feel that, that that's really what the underlying need is, but you want to uh, draft your needs in terms of something more specific. And you'll notice here the use of the with non-disabled peers relates specifically to the um, LRE requirement. So once you have developed your statement of needs, you'll use those needs to develop annual measurable goals. Um, Also, just to, when, you, when you go to the IEP meeting, you often will have received a draft IEP before. So it's not like you're just creating these goals at the meeting. There's usually um, some conversation. You may have received the draft ahead of time. It's very helpful to receive the draft ahead of time so that you can look at it and then talk about how you might modify the goals. They can't be determined ahead of time, but they can be drafted in preparation for the meeting. Um, one of the key things about the IEP meeting is that you cannot have predetermination. That means the school cannot present the goals and tell you that's what they are. This is an interactive process. It's something that you, you need to have participation in. But, um, but it's very helpful to get the goals ahead of time so that you know what you're going to be discussing. Um, the, 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 the goals address the needs so the student can be involved and make progress in the ed general education curricula, as well as in activity, extracurricular activities. Um, and, and general education also includes physical education. And sometimes I think that gets sort of overlooked as well. Um, and other educational needs that result from the disability. So we always wanna check to make sure the annual goals are measurable because otherwise it's hard to tell if the student is making progress toward the goals. Um, IDEA requires, um, again, just that, that requires the goals be measurable and they're designed to meet the needs that result from the disability. There are five critical elements in, in describing a goal. It's the who, the what, um, to what level or degree, under what conditions and in what length of time. Let's see. So most of the time, maybe all of the time, um, the usual type of goals in IEPs are SMART goals. You may have heard of SMART goals in other contexts. Um, that means they are specific, what you want your child to know and be able to do. Measurable means we have to count or observe it. Um, action action-oriented, using action words, realistic and relevant to address individual needs. Um, and then time-limited, since we're looking at an annual IEP plan. And um, SMART, SMART goals are definitely, they're, they're the main type of goal that we see in IEP, um, IEPs, but um, you, you may have a preference in a certain area for, or something for another type of goal. So be open-minded um, if you feel like something else would serve your, your child. Think about that as well. So here's some examples of annual goals. Um, the need is Mario needs to fluently decode words with more than one syllable. So the goal would be Mario will read a fifth grade text with 95% accuracy at a rate of 75 words per minute. And that's really the format you'll see a lot of goals. So after a while, you'll be really familiar with that. They were able to do something with some kind of accuracy at this level. And this is based on his baseline. Um, 
where Mario currently reads third grade texts with 97% accuracy at a rate of 68 words per minute. And sometimes there might be discussion, you know, can, can Mario make that jump from third grade to fifth grade this year? Um, sometimes you might look back at, you know, well, you know how, how, where was he at the beginning of last year? How much progress did he make? But you wanna tie that all together. So here we have some examples. I don't know if anyone wants to write in the chat whether they think um, these are measurable. Please feel free to write in the chat if you if you have an opinion. Like so, the first one says Mario will improve his writing skills. This will be measured by teacher observation. Um, so I'm not seeing any chat activity, but. That, that says how it will be measured, but it's not, um, it's, yes, exactly, um, it's not measurable. Um, you, might, you might talk about, um, like, well, you'll look at where his writing is. Maybe he's working on writing more complex sentences. Maybe he's writing longer sentences. And so you would write a goal that um, would in, increase his writing based on where he is. So next we have Monica will learn multiple multiplication facts, zero to 12. This will be measured by written and oral testing. Does anyone feel like that is measurable? Um, so it does tell you how it will be measured. It will be measured by written and oral testing, but it doesn't tell you um, with what, um, it just says that they'll learn this and measure it, but we don't know, you know what, what level of accuracy. Um, so you might wanna say he'll, um, yeah, you'll, you, you may say that he'll complete, um, you know, the zero to 12 times table, with um, getting X percentage correct in um, you know, this time period or something. So you need more, this isn't enough. You could measure it by written and oral testing, but you need to say what, what amount of accuracy you want um, and um, a little more detail about how you're gonna measure that. Um, and here is um, an attention goal. John will improve his ability to stay on task and pay attention. This will be measured by teacher observation. Um, so what do you think about that? I, I think some of these executive functioning and attention goals can be hard um, because some of the stuff it's hard to um, determine the opportunities or to keep track of them. Like sometimes, sometimes that's an issue of, of how you're gonna track things. Yeah, it, it's, it's not measurable. Because what are you, what are you, how are you telling if he's staying on task? But I mean, sometimes there may be, you know, sometimes someone has to circle back and keep saying, um, you know, getting the person on task. So you might want to have to reduce the number, the amount of teacher intervention or, or something like that. But, but those can be a little bit tricky because when you're reading and writing, you can, there's sort of metrics and tests and things you can use and in math as well. But some of the attentional ones can be a little more tricky. Um, short term objectives are, um, they used to be required, but they are not anymore. They, um, except if you are, um, if you're determined to take the alternative assessments, um, which is, is a small number the, they're not supposed to be went more than 1%. Um, but a short-term objective still is, is like a, um, a way that you can break up the step to make sure that you're making progress toward the goal. So rather, even if they're not required, you might wanna say, we'd like to see this by you know, quarter two or something. So that you have some steps rather than letting it go um, and, and not making progress along the way. Progress monitoring is an important part because we want it, as I said, we wanna see that we're making progress toward their goals along the way. 
So the team will discuss how will the child's progress be measured, when will it be measured and by whom, how often will parents receive a progress report, and how will that report be delivered. And this is another thing where they often have a standard procedure where they have a, a progress monitoring report form as part of their data management system. Um, and often schools may give those at the same time that they give report cards, they may not, but um, you wanna ask these questions so that you know what you should be looking for. Um, and, and you also wanna know sometimes you'll have a goal and the goal sounds great, but especially some of these um, behavior goals and things like that, you wanna make sure you're, well, who's gonna measure this? Because some of these things require someone observing and taking notes. Um, so you want to just check and then again, so and then depending because it is individualized depending on your child's needs, you may need a more frequent progress report than the quarterly one. So you want to talk about um, what's what's what period of time makes sense for this child to um, give progress. Um, and then finally, how will the report be delivered? Email is common, but um, there are, there are many different options. And especially as your student ages, you want the student to be increasingly taking more responsibility. And so um, as, as you go through the process that the way you do these reporting may change. Um, for example, sent home with a student that may, might seem, well, in some ways in, in elementary school, sometimes I know that they have folders. So it's easier in some ways to send things home, but, um, you want to make sure it's a reliable way in a way you're going to get that information. So always, if you're in the IEP meeting and you're wondering, go ahead and ask so that you're, you know what's ahead. Oops, went the wrong way. So the next item will be the special education and related services and supplementary aids and service. Um, these, these, should be based on peer reviewed research to the extent practical, practicable. Um, sometimes there can be disagreement in the IEP process on what those should be exactly. Um, and the, the parents don't get to choose what it is, but you can talk about the need and what they need. And sometimes um, people have programs that they use. And so the IDEA doesn't say parents can pick the program for this, but but you definitely are involved in the discussion. So that includes, again, supports for extracurricular and non-academic activities. Um, and you wanna use methods that have shown to be effective. There's a lot of conversation about reading instruction right now, if you see in the news that um, the, there, there's sort of approved reading instruction methods now that have been shown to be effective. So you'll wanna, make sure that they're research-based if possible. And there's some things there may not be that option. Um, next, we, you will have a statement of the accommodations. And again, we, th there's accommodations and modifications. And sometimes it's not clear, is this an accommodation or a modification? So a way that kind of a quick way to kind of think about it is an accommodation changes how they're receiving the instruction or demonstrates their learning. It's not what they're learning, but it's the how. Um, so for example, if you have a reading disability, you might have audio books um, versus having the, the text. Um, and uh, other accommodations might be extended time for testing, um, you may have the opportunity to present your understanding in a different way. Um, and again, there they are accommodations for all general education activities and ex extracurricular activities. Um, at least in my personal experience, I found that we spent a lot of time focusing on the kind of what are considered the core activities and sometimes um, extra or elective classes and things didn't get as much attention, but those are really important for the students development. So you wanna make sure that you're paying attention to all areas. And then you also will have accommodations for state and district assessments, and those will be included in the IEP as well. 
So again, modifications are, they change what the student learns. Um, for, you might, for instance, if they're reading one version of a story, you, your student might have a different version of that story that's at a different reading level, or um, they might have um, a different expectation of what they're supposed to show on to, to demonstrate what they've learned from the, the, the curriculum. So this is, this is a change in the actual um, curriculum that they're learning. And again, this applies in all areas, general education activities and extracurricular curricular activities, um, including physical education. If the student requires mod modifications to state standards, they may require alternate assessments. And again, that's, I, I can't remember what the name of it is, but there, there is an option to take alternate assessments, assessments and you won't take the standard state test. And again, that is supposed to be about 1% of students. Um, and there is new, a new requirement to document that parents understand the implications. Some, some, sometimes, and this varies district to district, so you'll need to check with your, um, either your special education teacher or your special education director. But in some places, the, um, the alternate assessment can have effects in um, future, um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, in some states, which I, I don't believe in Colorado, but I'm not 100% certain. In some states, if you take the alternate assessment, it can affect what kind of diploma you can get. In Colorado, we don't have an alternate diploma, but you still wanna make sure that you understand what taking the alternate assessment means. Um, and the new, there's a new requirement that wasn't there before that there has to be documentation that parents understand implications of a, the alternate assessment. And make sure you, if, if you are in such a situation that you do that, make sure you do really understand because sometimes I, on the form, there'll be like a check here that you understand the implications, but make sure you, the implications have been explained to you and you, you do understand rather than just checking it. Um, let's see. Okay, and then the next thing you'll have is the date services and modification starts, how often the location and duration. Um, key point is that they need to be adequate to meet the student's needs and can result in the child reaching his or her goals. And so this is usually in a table and it'll be very specific um, about the number of minutes per week or number of minutes per month. Um, how many days per week. Location would be, could be in the classroom or it could be out of the, the classroom. And that's something that um, is important to discuss. Sometimes they, they talk about push-in services or pull-out services. And so sometimes they will pull your child out of the classroom to receive a more personalized intervention. But there's, there's always a balance there because they are missing what's going on in the classroom if they're pulled out. So um, some people prefer push in where they're in there with the student in the classroom, supporting them on what's happening in the classroom. So when you look at location, it, it's not sort of like um, in room 107, um, it would be like in the classroom or pulled out. And, and then again, duration is um, the, the amount of time as well as when you're gonna be providing those. And I sort of like that. That's one of the things when I get my draft of the IEP, I kind of flip to that. And um, you want to make sure that's all correct when you're finalizing the IEP. So again, you want to make sure that, that they're adequate to meet the student's needs. And so you'll look at the number of minutes um, and how much time they're spending getting that support. For those of you who have a student in high school, um, transition components are very important. The, the federal law says that annually beginning at age 18 or younger if appropriate, goals related to training, education, employment, independent living skills, only where appropriate are discussed. In Colorado, 
Um, our Early Child Education Act provides that this begins at the age of 15, um, no later than the end of ninth grade, but it could also be earlier. Um, and there's a lot of attention on transition now because um, the research on the, what's happening with students after school um, wasn't as positive as we would like to see. And so there's been a lot more attention put to transition now. So you really wanna make sure this, these discussions are happening. I know in, um, when, we, when, when my child started middle school, we started talking about transition then because you just, you really wanna just start building those skills as early as you can, but it's not necessarily required that, but you wanna be thinking in that future direction. So, um, and again, that's where if you're discussing transition, then the student is required to be invited. Um, and then you also may have later on in transition have um, representatives of different agencies that work with youth. Um, for example, the Division of Vocational, Re Vocational Rehabilitation that helps work with employment. You may have representatives of agencies come to your meeting to help create the plan for the future. So I just, I guess I just said that child must be invited if considering post-secondary goals and transition services. If the child doesn't attend, the school must ensure that his or her preferences and interested, interests are considered in planning. And this is another area where parent input is so important. I mean, we obviously want the youth in, involved with this, but sometimes um, schools may not see as much of the child as a parent does. So the parent has a more holistic view of the child. Um, and so you don't wanna get your child stuck in something that isn't what they really want. Um, I mean, I think that happens to all of us, whether we have a disability or not. Sometimes we feel pressure to go in a certain way. And so there's a good opportunity to kind of listen and pay attention and, um, sometimes people say, you know, think scientifically, but really kind of look at your child and what's going on and try and get an understanding so that you can um, create a path that feels relevant and meaningful to your student and not just something that people told them they should do. Um, and again, that's, as I mentioned, when, when appropriate, the school must invite participating agency likely to provide or pay for transition services. So if you're working with the um, community center board or um, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, you know, those would, those agencies would be involved. Um, accessible instructional materials, you need timely access to appropriate and accessible instructional materials and um, taking reasonable steps to provide these materials at the same time that other children receive their instructional materials. So again, I'm just using the example of if, if, the, if, if this child needs a digital copy of a book, you need to make sure if you're the, the school, they need to make sure that they're providing your school with their digital copy or their audio copy. At the same time, they're providing the uh, paper copy to other students. Um, amending IEPs, you, you can amend or modify the IEP without an IEP team meeting. Um, it requires the parent and the school to agree. Um, parents need to help write the amendments. The entire IEP team needs to be informed of these changes. And then you have to, the initial IEP, they, they give you a copy, but for some reason with amendments, you have to request a copy of the IEP with the amendments. Um, and make sure that everyone serving the child needs a copy of amendments. Sometimes you get, especially as you get into the later years, there's a lot of people that work with your students, but even in elementary school, you'll have elective teachers and stuff and everyone, your student is a student of the school. They're not just a student, um, a special education student in certain classes so that really everyone needs to be aware of their needs and make sure that they're um, supporting the student. You, you wanna be careful about doing IEP, I think this is the next slide actually, carefully consider before agreeing to amend the IEP without all the team members because it's something that all the team members have to carry out 
and so you want to make sure that they're there when you're making this amendment. If they're if it's going to involve them, that they um, that they're there when you're making this amendment because you want them to have buy-in and agree to the amendment since they're going to be carrying it out. But so you want to use amendments for minor changes. That's what the purpose of the amendment is because sometimes you might want to change. You know, for example, we we. I wanted to change occupational therapy service minutes. And that doesn't really affect anyone else except for the IEP and, and the, our case manager, you know that. So you don't wanna to have to call an IEP meeting to make a simple change. Or sometimes um, like maybe an opportunity comes up for a new program. Um, I know like we've been at school where they have a new program on social skills, like a new socials group. And they're like, we wanna put this in your IEP. And that doesn't, you know, the whole team doesn't need to come because they're not involved in carrying it out. So you want it to be a minor change, but you do want to make sure that if it, if people are affected by it and it, they're expected to be involved with the change, you want to make sure that they're involved in the discussion of it. So it's a great convenience and you want to make sure that um, you use it when it's appropriate. And again, we talked a little bit about this at our last meeting, I mean, our last, our last uh, webinar, but um, you, you wanted to monitor your emotions in the process of developing this IEP. The, the IEP meetings can be very emotional. There's usually a lot going on with the student um, and there's, there can be a lot of worries. You know, if, if your child's struggling socially, you worry about if they're making friends. Sometimes we're worried about the long-term future. So, and sometimes they may be really having a hard time at school. And so sometimes the answers are not easy. So it, it can feel very emotional. It's a natural part of the human experience and definitely a natural part of the IEP meeting. I, I think IEP meetings are interesting because they're, they're sort of a business meeting, but they're very personal and it involves complex issues relating to this special human being that is at the center of the discussion. So during the meeting, monitor your emotions, think about how you can take care of yourself during the meeting. Um, some, success, some suggestions, have a friend or advocate go to the meeting that can be really helpful to have support. Um, sometimes when you're the parent, you've got so much going on in your head and thinking about things. And sometimes you sort of have trouble keeping track of it all. So it's helpful to have a friend, even just to debrief after the meeting. Um, if you choose to use an advocate, an advocate can really go through your IEP and help you understand it. And, and sometimes advocates can be really helpful in coming up with um, goals. Sometimes an advocate, that's what they do is they focus on IPs and they think about things. And if you if your, your IEP team is, is busy and they're doing all kinds of IEPs, so sometimes your advocate can take a little more time with the IEP to just really focus on it. Um, take a break. It's okay to ask for a break. Um, there's sometimes it feels like there's time pressure and you need to just get through the IEP meeting. But um, I mean, the goal is to create the best IEP that's possible. Again, the the I the the IDEA does not provide for the best IEP for the child. Um, so um, it's more sometimes in the they used to have this Cadillac. Um, Chevrolet analogy that you don't get the Cadillac, you get the Chevrolet, but people think that's sort of outdated. I've heard someone say it's sort of, you don't get the high-end restaurant buffet, you get more of a, a regular restaurant buffet, but you do want to make the best of the best IEP you can. So um, even though, you know, so sometimes it might feel like, oh, this is going to take longer, but really that might save time in the long run. So if you need a break, take a break. Sometimes someone in the meeting might suggest a break. You can tape record the meeting so you don't have to remember everything. It's courteous to let people know that you plan to record and it helps build trust with the people and the team. If you just say, I'd like to record the meeting, it's hard for me to remember things. Um, and if you're on the if you're on the school side, you know, don't take that as a me as a lack of trust. It's really that some people need time to process this. And when it's emotional, it's hard to take everything in. But but again, do try and let people know if, if that's something that you want to do. Um, 
drink water, especially here in Colorado, breathe and always keep the focus on helping your child. Um, again, the whole team is focused on helping this child. And sometimes when there's tension or conflict, you might lose track of that because it can get personal between people. That's why um, people who are doing student-led IEP sometimes find that there's less contention in that meeting because the child's really there and, and you're all seeing them. And you don't have to approve the IEP right there. If there's something, particularly some of the things that can be controversial might be a change of placement um, or um, cutting back on certain services. Um, sometimes I hear that people, as the student gets closer to transition age and gets closer to graduating, sometimes there's some disagreement about how much to cut back on support. Sometimes people want more communication. Sometimes people want the child to take a bigger role. So like if there's a big decision, you can you can take time. And I, I always, I mean, we always in my IP meetings would just, you know, this is what we think, but we wouldn't finalize it right then because you, you, you want to have time to process that. So even if you're not making a big decision, it's a big document and it, it's important. So even if it's not a big decision, but you feel like you need time to process what was presented, just ask for time. And sometimes the school districts will have deadlines like these IEPs, all IEPs have to be done at this deadline and you'll see the team working really hard. And these, these teams work so hard. That's another, another part as a parent is we often don't see how hard the teachers work because they've got so many documentation requirements and the teaching requirements and the data collection requirements. And so the more you can do to support your teachers is helpful too, but definitely take the time you need. Some um, tips for parents regarding the IEP, know when your signature matters for service. I know that you need to, um, you need to sign the consents for certain things but there's other things, and I don't, I don't have the details on this. You could check with, um, I don't know, Pam, if you know, um, you, your signature is not always required. So know when your signature matters. And if you wanna get more detail on that, you can check with one of our parent advisors. Always sign the attendance sheet, which um, you're, you're not gonna have the physical attendance sheet right now because meetings aren't happening in person, but you do, you do wanna know you do want to note that you were there and you also want to make sure everyone who's at the meeting, make sure you know who everyone at the meeting is and what their role is, what role they're filling and, um, and make sure that everyone, everyone is signing it. Um, the key, key feature is really IEP team includes parents. That is in the law. Parents are expected to meaningfully participate in the IEP process. And so that means it's not like you're just, if you're a parent, you're not just showing up to hear about your student. It's not like a conference where there's, um, you know, someone's gonna tell you things. It's, this is actual participation. And the more engaged you can be, the better the process will usually go. But you wanna do, you wanna do some preparation of your own before the IEP team meeting. Really think about what's important to you. What do you want to happen at the meeting? Um, be smart about SMART goals. Um, really think about your goals too, because sometimes it's sort of, I have to admit, sometimes my eyes sort of glaze over when I'm reading the IEP. And sometimes I kind of want to, like, I like to kind of think bigger picture. Is my child making progress? What's his future going to look like? And so sometimes it's hard for me to get down into the SMART goals and really think about them. Um, but you want to make sure that, um, that the goals are working toward what's meaningful for your student. Um, and sometimes you will have disagreements. Like, like I had discussions like, well, do you really think he can get that far? And then sometimes they want your goal to be achievable, but you don't want to lower expectations for your child on your SMART goals. So just really think about it, make sure the goals are clear, make sure they're moving in the right direction and make sure they have those, those parts. And I think that's another thing that varies. Some teachers are really skilled at writing SMART goals. There's, there's a lot of, I mean, in education generally, there's a lot of turnover these days. I saw an article recently that teacher turnover has increased. And so you will have some teachers that are very new to the process. And so there are things that they may not have 
heard yet. And so be generous and understanding. And, um, you know, if there's something that you have a question about, you know, try and ask it in a constructive way, but don't assume necessarily that the teachers have had all the training that they need to, for writing IEPs. And then remember PEAK as a resource for questions. PEAK is a great resource. Um, I, it, I love when people attend these trainings just to learn the basics about the IEP, but then you go back to school and you're dealing with all your relationships with the teachers, trying to get your homework done and sort of the, the legal requirements sort of slip out of your head. And so if you're wondering about something like my school's telling me this, is that right? Call Peak. They've got parent advisors that can give you one-on-one -on -one advice. If they don't know the answer, they can refer you to someone else. And so if you have a specific question about something that's happening, or if there's something that is important to you, for instance, at Peak, we value inclusion. You might be able to call and say, my, my school doesn't doesn't promote inclusion, what could I do? And they can give you some tips on how to create goals for inclusion. So take advantage of the resources. Something we hear from parents a lot is that this process is very isolating. Um, there aren't sort of parent events. Uh, I don't know what, you know, parent events where you connect with parents who also have IEPs and then because of confidentiality reasons, you don't necessarily know who else has IEPs. So sometimes it can feel like, you're alone in this process. And then there's these other parents that kids don't have any issues and are, you know, sometimes they'll tell you about all their achievements. So, um, so reach out and know that there are resources and communities out there. You just have to find them. And now I'll hand this back to Pam. Thank you, Anne. As soon as we are able to add captions to this webinar recording, we will post it to our website under archived webinars. And like last week, we're doing a random drawing. This week, it's a, for the Rights Law book from emotions to advocacy. Like last week, I put all your names in a random name picker called Mini Web Tool. So here it goes. And the winner is, uh-oh, I haven't. Oh, the winner is Linda. So Linda, uh, I think Linda was a active I will participant be, in the chat, I believe. Good, I, Linda, I will be contacting you via email to confirm your address so we can get that mailed out to you. Um, again, to request a certificate of completion, please email me at pchristy at peakparent.org. That's P-C-H-R-I-S-T-Y at peakparent.org. Thank you again to our wonderful presenter, Ann, and to oh, everyone. Can I, can I just say one thing? Yeah. I just yeah. wanted to add that if you are interested in virtual IEP meetings on oh, Tuesday, yes. I'll mm -hmm. be giving a webinar on preparing for a virtual IEP meeting. So if you're interested in learning more about the virtual format and things you should expect, please sign up for our webinar. And Anne, would that be found on the, this is a cop, this is just a screenshot of our PEAK website. Will, would it be found on the PEAK website to register? Yeah. You can okay. find it on the PEAK website, or if you want to email me, it's a Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N at peakparent.org. And I can send you information as well. Perfect. Next slide, please. So um, Anne talked a little bit about the Peak Parent Center resources. We offer webinars like this. Um, Anne also does some um, improving IEP team webinars and then the one that she talked about that's also next week. We provide parent advisors in English and Spanish. That's Monday through Friday. Right now due to COVID, they're available from 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. We have regional parent connectors across the state. Um, that when it's not COVID, attend resource fairs and share information and present about PEAK. Um, we offer virtual workshops across the state right now. Um, and then our annual conference is coming up on inclusive education. It's February 18th through 20th, and it will be virtual. And you can find out more information on our website. We are offering youth and parent scholarships at this time. And all that information is found on our website. So please, please check that out. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please contact any parent advisor at PEAK. Um, do we have any more slides, Anne? Is there one more slide? Let's see. 
Yes. So here's our contact information, um, our phone number, our email, and then the parent advisors can be reached at parentadvisor at peakparent.org. So on behalf of Peak Parent Center and our today's presenter, thank you for joining us. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your day. We hope you join us next week for the final in the IEP series, implementation and follow-up of the IEP. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.